celebrating or observing Christ's ascension to the right hand of God. We'll have the wonderful opportunity to see and hear about all that our risen Savior continues to do for us, his people. May God bless our time together in his word. We'll sing our opening hymn, hymn 169, Alleluia, sing to Jesus.
be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, King of glory, on this day you ascended far above the heavens, and at God's right hand you rule the nations. Leave us not alone, we pray, but grant us the spirit of truth, that at your command and by your power we may be your witnesses in all the world. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our first reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 1. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God, On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. The word of the Lord. We'll sing our psalm of the day, Psalm 47, and we will sing Psalm 47 according to the tune for hymn number 84. Our second reading is from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 1. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, 
I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your hearts may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. The word of the Lord. Please stand. Alleluia. Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke chapter 24. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. The gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. We'll continue with our hymn of the day, hymn 171, a hymn of glory, let us sing.
the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ, your brothers and sisters. In our epistle reading, St. Paul shared with us his constant and continued prayer for the Christians in Ephesus. And his prayer really is a beautiful prayer. It's a powerful prayer. And it serves as a great model for us Christians to follow in our own prayer lives. But to be certain, the value of St. Paul's prayer certainly extends far beyond that. You see, the body of Christ always needs Paul's prayer said on her behalf because we do face many challenges in this world. And given our evil and wicked surroundings, the body of Christ does need to be reminded that these blessings for which St. Paul prays are blessings that all of us do actually and in real fact receive. And especially as we observe our Lord's ascension to the right hand of God's majesty, glory, and might, we also need to be reminded, just as St. Paul does for us here, that we, his body, truly are the beneficiaries of his ascension ruling. Now, of course, the prayer that St. Paul offers here was originally offered for those faithful in Ephesus. They needed this prayer. Those Ephesians lived in a world that was confusing and uncertain, and they were sinners just like anybody else who were prone to, to seeing God's grace and promises with blurry vision. We too need St. Paul's prayer. Because just like those Ephesians, we also live in a world that is confusing and uncertain. And we too are sinners who don't always see the great things of God as clearly as we ought to. I mean, you know as well as I do that every one of us has that sinful nature residing in our hearts. And that sucker ain't going to go away. That sinful nature is, is it's like a stubborn donkey. You can pull the reins, but that stubborn donkey isn't going to budge. You can stand behind and push, but that stubborn donkey is not going to budge. As long as I live on this planet, as long as I live and breathe the oxygen here, that sinful nature is going to be with me. And yes, that sinful nature does impact the way that I approach God, and it affects the way that I think about God's word and about God's promises. It can be hard to see God's love when I'm at the hospital bed or when I'm at the funeral. It can be really difficult to understand how God could still be ruling the universe when I hear about terrible things like murders and rapes and other violence going on. On the flip side of the equation, it can be so easy to neglect God especially when I overindulge myself in all of the secular helps, the the secular self-help books and TED Talks and and things of the like. When I overindulge in that, I may forget about God. And and it can be just as easy to forget about God when when I overly emphasize my own successes and my own triumphs. How hard it is to see God clearly with crisp and clear vision with everything that our world has to offer, with the many events that go on in our world, it sure can be hard to see God's providence and his love and his mercy. With everything that goes on here, it kind of makes looking at God's providence and love like looking at that eye chart without the glasses on, right? You can be set up a ways away, but if those lenses are gone, You just can't read those lines, right? That's the way it is for us in this world. After all, we do live by faith and not by sight. As long as we live with imperfect faiths, well, our vision of God will not be clear. It won't be perfect. And no, the, 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 the root problem here is not my eyes, The root problem is that sinful nature that lives in my heart. And that sinful nature does not want to believe in God. It doesn't want to hear about God. 
And there are many times when I do indulge that sinful nature. I mean, that's just the way it works. Sinners gonna sin. But that is why the body of Christ, that is why we need this prayer that St. Paul offers here in Ephesians chapter 1. I mean, just consider the great things that St. Paul teaches us in this prayer about the Christian faith. The very first thing that St. Paul brings up is, is faith, is it not? He, he thanks God for the gift of faith. And why shouldn't he do that? God accomplishes the most amazing, life-changing things in us through faith, right? Through faith, God takes our sins away. Through faith, God gives me the holiness of Jesus. Through faith, God saves me and delivers me. Faith is everything. God be praised that he has given me that faith. But St. Paul doesn't just stop there, does he? No, he doesn't. He goes on. You are believers. You have this faith. And look at everything else that God promises to give you, his faithful people. We heard St. Paul speak about the hope of our calling. Our hope is this, that I will be in heaven. You too will be in heaven. And that's a guarantee. That's a done deal. And that is so on account of your calling. Already, in eternity, God selected you. He, he handpicked each one of you individually and said, I want that one to be my own. I want that one to dwell with me in glory forever and ever. And that choice that God makes is effective. It's a choice that he follows through on. That is why God did call you to faith. That is why God is preserving you in this faith. Your hope is certain because of the calling that God has given you. And that hope, it is that amazing. It is that big of a deal. St. Paul goes on. He, he speaks about the riches of God's glorious inheritance. And let me tell you, that inheritance is rich. It is full. It is glorious beyond anything that we know, beyond anything we understand, beyond anything that we could experience. When you receive that inheritance, when you receive that inheritance... You won't know pain and loss. No tear will ever flow from your eyes again. When you receive that inheritance, you will be a partaker of God's glory. God's goodness will fill you up. When you receive that inheritance, God will be all in all for you. Nothing to take that away. Nothing to destroy that. Nothing to undermine that. That inheritance goes far beyond anything that we could comprehend. But it is coming. Finally, Paul speaks about something that is taking place in our lives right now. Something that we don't have to look forward to. St. Paul reminds us that God's surpassingly great power is at work within us. And that power, too, is just as great. The, the power that raised Jesus from the dead, the power that ascended Jesus to heaven, sat him down at glory at God's right hand, that is the same power at work in you and me day by day. And that power can't be curbed. That power can't be slowed down. God will continue to work in you, through you, with you, and for you with that unstoppable power of his. In this prayer, Paul really does give us a, a refreshing and eye-opening lesson about our Christian faith. He shows us these amazing truths. He increases our hope. But he doesn't just teach. He also asks he offers those petitions to the Lord God on behalf of God's people, and they really are rather important petitions that St. Paul makes. In the first place, he asks that God would grant us a spirit of wisdom and revelation. And that is to say, may God grant to the believers a mindset that is always seeking to know more about their Savior. May God grant those believers that mindset that is always seeking to understand Christ and the gospel as fully as possible. Paul goes on with his prayer. He asks that God would open the eyes of our hearts, that he would enlighten the eyes of our hearts, which is to say, may God illumine us. 
May he further increase our understanding. May we begin to grasp more and more how full and rich the gospel of Jesus is. And as we grow, as we grow, may this fullness of the gospel of Jesus guide and direct both our willing and our doing. Brothers and sisters, the body of Christ needs this prayer. We live in a world that wants to lead us astray. We have our own weaknesses that do lead us astray. We need this prayer, so pray this prayer. Thank God for faith. You have received no greater gift than that. Thank him for it. And pray that he would increase it. Pray that God would give you that spirit, that mindset, that desires to be in his word. Pray that God would open your heart and your mind so that you may know Christ more and more. Pray that God would strengthen you through this increasing knowledge of Jesus so that you might keep that sinful nature, that stubborn donkey in check when it tries to run wild and lead you astray. Pray this prayer. Pray it for everyone at Calvary. Pray it for all Christians. And pray it for yourself. As you take Paul's words and make them your own, as you offer this prayer in in your private lives, also know that God will grant you these requests. He will do this. Martin Luther teaches us in the small catechism that God's will is always done. And it is God's will that we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, 2 Peter chapter 3. So as you make this prayer, you can be confident that God will give you what you ask. You can be confident that God will do this for you. The body of Christ really does need this prayer. We certainly need the increase in understanding and knowledge. It serves as a great model for us to follow And it gives us some amazing reminders about our Christian faith. It teaches us some great truths about the faith to which we have been called. And chief among these great truths that Paul teaches us here are the ongoing activities of the ascended Lord Jesus. And as Paul shows us in this prayer, you and I truly are the beneficiaries of Christ's ascension ruling. You remember what Paul said about the power of God that is at work within us? It's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And you know the story as well as I do. You know that Jesus was beaten mercilessly. You know that Jesus suffered a violent and gruesome death. That was a man who had no business being alive. But God exerted his mighty power in Jesus. And no matter what they could do to him, God's almighty power was not going to be stopped. Jesus comes back to life. Truly an amazing display of God's power, but maybe more significant for us as we think about this ascension day is how God exerted that power in Christ again 40 days after Easter. God exerted his power in Jesus again by glorifying him by exalting him to the absolute highest place in the heavenly realm. God sat Jesus down at his right hand in power and authority, gave him a name that is above every name. Jesus has been exalted to the highest place. With all of that accomplished, with the eternal Son of God returned to his heavenly abode, with the eternal Son of God dwelling at God's right hand, with all of that accomplished, Jesus is now exercising his power and authority, his absolute power and authority. And he will do that forever. Paul says to us that Jesus has been made higher, far above every power and authority and dominion and rule and every name that can be named. Think about some of the Titles given to the most powerful people that have ever lived. King, czar, pharaoh, Caesar, Kaiser, dictator, president. Jesus is above them all. 
If you took all of those people and, and smashed them together, if you took all of their power and smashed it together, Jesus would still be far and away above them all. There is no power that can quell Jesus' authority. There is no rule that can undermine what he does. There is no ruler who can stop Jesus. They have all been placed underneath him. And it is not just the rulers who are under Jesus. Absolutely everything has been subjected to him. St. Paul says to us, God placed everything under Jesus' feet and appointed him to be head over everything. Think about the natural realm. Everything that takes place outside of these walls. Jesus has power and dominion over weather and nature. Jesus has power and dominion over the mountains and the deserts and the oceans and the forests. There is absolutely nothing in this creation that exists outside of Jesus' control. Absolutely nothing can happen in this creation apart from his domain. And the things that do happen, none of them are able to cross over the boundaries that Jesus has set. Jesus is large and he is in charge and he ain't gonna be stopped. His power and his authority are that absolute. Head over everything. And note well, note well who it is that Jesus is exercising this power for. God made Jesus head over everything or the church. Jesus guiding and ruling activity, the way that he governs and directs, it all points to one grand purpose, the good of his people. That means that Jesus is ruling, directing, guiding and governing for you. Yes, Jesus does have you in mind as he exercises his authority. Yes, Jesus is thinking about you when he directs the affairs of this world as he does. It's all for you. It is all for his people. Lest our eyes deceive us, lest our hearts lead us astray and we begin to doubt our benefactor, St. Paul shows us why we may have absolute confidence in the ruling activity of Jesus. Paul makes a most grand statement, a most mind-blowing statement in verse 23. The church is Christ's body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. You are in Jesus. You make Jesus up. You are a part of him. Think about how amazing that is. Think about how full of comfort that is. You fill up Jesus. You fill up the one who fills up everything in this universe. And this is to say that you, as a special member of Christ's body, are that significant. You are that important. Jesus esteems you with the highest affection and love. Jesus loves you that dearly. He would consider himself to be incomplete if he didn't have you. So he chose you, called you, incorporated you into himself. Brothers and sisters, you are in Jesus, and Jesus is in you. And that is why Jesus is fighting for you. That is why Jesus will continue to fight for you. That is why Jesus will continue to carry out his plan on your behalf. Jesus isn't just fighting for random people. Jesus isn't just fighting for strangers. He is fighting for his body. He is fighting for you. He will always do that. Remember that. Remember that Jesus has absolute power and authority over everything. Remember that Jesus is always using that absolute power and authority. And remember how Jesus carries out that rule. Jesus says, I know that your faith often falters. I know that your faith is often weak. 
So I'll give you my word and my sacraments to build you up. Jesus says, I know how the devil is trying to take you away from me, but no one can snatch you out of my hands. Jesus says, I know how weak you can become, but my power is made perfect in your weakness. Jesus says, I know how much my church is hated by this sinful world, but not even the gates of hell and Hades will overcome my people. Jesus says, I know how intense it can be. I know how great the pain can be. But I work all things together for good to them that love me. Brothers and sisters, all of that is what the ascended Christ promises to do for you. All of that is what the ascended Christ is doing for you. And all of that is what the ascended Christ will continue to do for you. For just a moment, I want you to imagine a a picture, an illustration, a powerful illustration that, that demonstrates love and affection, things like that. A mother creates life in her womb. She brings life into the world. She nurses her child. She watches her child grow up. She will love that child until the day that she dies. The affection that a mother has for her child is is beautiful, it's powerful. But I tell you, the, the affection and love that Jesus has for you is even greater than the affection and love that a mother has for her child. And that is exactly why St. Paul offers up this prayer In Ephesians chapter 1, he makes this prayer so that we Christians might know and understand as fully as we can just how wide and deep and high and long the love of Christ is. St. Paul makes this prayer so that we may become more certain of our hope of the riches of God's glorious inheritance so that we may always know the power that is working within us. St. Paul makes this prayer to remind us that our loving Savior, our dear Jesus, is still ruling with us in mind. And let us never forget that. Jesus' love, his power, his authority, his rule, the inheritance that he is preparing, it's all for you. God be praised. Amen. Please stand. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. We join to confess our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped, who has spoken through the prophets. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We'll now gather our offering. This time, those who are making their confirmation vows are invited forward. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our Lord Jesus said to his disciples, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, 
and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. In obedience to the Lord's command, you have been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You have been taught the precious truths of the Christian faith as confessed by the Evangelical Lutheran Church. You know what God has given you by his grace and what he expects of you as his dear child. You now have the privilege of receiving the Lord's body and blood in the sacrament of Holy Communion. You are here to make a public profession of your Christian faith. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Romans, said, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Therefore, lift up your hearts to God of all grace and joyfully answer these questions. Do you this day in the presence of God and of this congregation acknowledge that in baptism God forgave, uh, God forgave your sins and granted you life and salvation? If so answer, I do. Do you reject the devil along with his lies and empty promises? Do you believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit? Do you believe all the books of the Bible to be the inspired word of God? Do you believe that the teaching of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, as you have learned to know it through Luther's small catechism, is faithful and true to the word of God? Do you intend to continue steadfast in this teaching and to endure all things, even death, rather than fall away from it? If so, answer, I do, and I ask God to help me. Do you intend faithfully to conform all your life to the teaching of God's word, to be faithful in the use of word and sacrament, and in faith and action remain true to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as long as you live? If so, answer, I do, and I ask God to help me. Since it is God alone who enables us both to will and to do his good pleasure, it is right for us, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, to call on him for these confirmands, that he would graciously complete the good work which he has begun in them. Let us therefore bow our heads and pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your great goodness in bringing these sons and daughters of yours to the knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ, and in giving them both hearts to believe and mouths to confess his saving name, Enable them to bring forth the fruits of faith and to continue steadfast and victorious until the day comes when all who have fought the good fight of faith shall receive the crown of righteousness through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters in Christ, What we as a Christian congregation have here asked our Heavenly Father to confer on all of you, we now ask him to give both of you individually. Gary, your passage from Romans chapter 12. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Gary, May God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, give you his Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and knowledge of grace and prayer, of power and strength, of sanctification and the fear of God. And Eric, our passage from Luke chapter 10. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Eric. May God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, give you his Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and knowledge, of grace and prayer, of power and strength, of sanctification and the fear of God. Your church now invites you to receive the sacrament of the Lord's body and blood. Accept this invitation with deep reverence and holy joy. Regard your communing at the Lord's table as a precious privilege given you by God through his church. Receive this sacrament thankfully and often. The Almighty and most merciful God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless and keep you. Welcome.
Please stand. Lord Jesus, great champion of our salvation, we praise you for ascending to heaven after your stunning victory over sin, Satan, and the grave. We praise you for completing your Father's rescue plan and for receiving from him all authority in heaven and on earth. Assure us each day that because you live and reign, our sins are forgiven, life is worth living, and death holds no terrors. Lord Jesus, living head of the church, we praise you for gathering us around your good news to be joined to you and united with one another. We praise you for the many dedicated servants of the word who proclaim repentance and forgiveness of sins to people from all nations and also to us. Equip us to be instruments of your peace in our time and place. Open our mouths to speak your good news and change our lives so that we reflect the beauty of the teachings of God our Savior in everything we do. Lord Jesus, mighty judge of the universe, we praise you for your promise that you will return to our world, not as a humble servant, but in full majesty, to take us to live with you. We praise you for the certainty of your promises and the justice of your judgment. Prepare us for the day when you will come again. Give us hearts that trust you more fully, hands eager to serve, ears opened to the music of your gospel, and lips to speak the truth in love. Keep us devoted to our common tasks in this life, yet keep our minds on things above, where our life is hidden with you, so that when you appear, we too will appear with you in glory. Now hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Lord Jesus, hear us, for you have ascended to intercede before the Father for us. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who rose from the dead in glorious triumph to bring forgiveness to the world and everlasting life to all who believe. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join in their glorious song. Blessed are you, O Lord of heaven and earth. We praise and thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, and we remember the great acts of love through which he has ransomed us from sin, death, and the devil's power. 
By his incarnation, he became one with us. By his perfect life, he fulfilled your holy will. By his innocent death, he overcame hell. By his rising from the grave, he opened heaven. Invited by your grace and instructed by your word, we approach your table with repentant and joyful hearts. Strengthen us through Christ's body and blood and preserve in us the true faith until we feast with him and all his ransomed people in glory everlasting. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. We give you thanks, O Lord, for the foretaste of the heavenly banquet that you have given us to eat and drink in this sacrament. Through this gift, you have fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your spirit, help us to live as your holy people until that day when you will receive us as your guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. We'll sing our closing hymn.
Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Risen indeed. Uh, fortunately, we're going to be putting that greeting away for a while. So Let's try it one more time with some gusto. Christ is risen. Good morning to uh, all of you. It was a joy to have all of you here. Gather around God's word and sacrament. Please certainly do keep our new confirmands in your prayers as well. I know they will be doing all of that for you. Uh, I don't believe that I have anything special to say or announce at this point. Unless I'm missing something. I see. Yes. Other than on Friday, uh, the first Friday of June, Ah, yeah, yeah. I was missing something. To start our, our, uh, family game night. Yeah, fellowship opportunity uh, starting on June second, first Friday of the month, seven to nine ish. Feel free to come on out, uh, bring yourself, bring some friends, games, cards, whatever you like to do. If you don't like to do that stuff, still come anyways, because um, we like each other here. So yeah, that is starting up on June second. June second, hopefully. We will see all of you there. God be with you all till we meet again.